requirement uh, for the high school graduation. Okay, so um, the, the board will remember approving the uh, high school program of study um, earlier of this year, um, minus one thing, and that was the uh, capstone requirement, which was still uh, being developed. Uh, this will be applicable um, to, I guess, everyone starting next year, right? Uh, grades 9 through uh, 12. And uh, we've had a great uh, committee of high school educators who have uh, worked on this and under Brenda Meyer's uh, guidance, uh, creating, creating what I think you're gonna find to be a very, very uh, good design, exciting, and will also bring meaning to the pathways in that the capstone will uh, be the application of what you learned in the pathway courses. No more electives, these are all related electives in a pathway. Um, to a real world problem or, or uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, solution. So um, we're going to have a relatively brief um, presentation on this. You received on Friday um, a um, description, a written description, uh, an outline of the capstones and the possibilities. So Brenda, um, if you would. Frank is going to start us off. Frank is going to start us off. I'm sorry. Okay, good evening everyone. Sounds a little off. We're gonna use this mic and pass it uh, around as we go through tonight's presentation. So I'd like to begin by first um, acknowledging the original work uh, of the original capstone design team from 2016, 2017. Some of them are here tonight, but most are uh, in other places. They were the uh, originators of of the work that we have before you tonight, so which is still in design phase, but um, their good work set the building blocks for uh, the 2018-2019 Capstone Development Team, and you can see here that this is uh, a uh, coalition of leaders and staff members from all four of our high schools, most of which who are here tonight. So I'd like you to take a moment to read our capstone mission statement. Um, when we began to meet with our design task force several months back, we spent a great deal of time on this capstone mission statement. It's, it's actually surprising how much time you spend in a room with people trying to figure out exactly what your mission is. But after many hours, uh, this is it. Um, and it's interesting that you know, at the time we're putting this together, the state of Connecticut no longer requires a capstone uh, for each graduating senior. But uh, we believe that a capstone experience is a necessary piece um, in a high schooler's four-year experience. Um, a culminating exercise that really provides uh, the student with an opportunity to demonstrate requisite knowledge and skills that they've developed over time. Now, um, the 
idea for senior capstones or culminating exhibitions was not created just in the past few years. Um, this really goes back to the 1980s and 1990s. There was a, a, a report, A Nation at Risk, which came out around 1984, and that was happening simultaneously with Ted Sizer's Coalition of Essential Schools movement. Uh, and Ted Sizer, who based his research out of Brown University, was looking to figure out how to redesign the American high school. And at the core of that uh, research and, and design work was the notion that uh, students needed to be able to demonstrate mastery as opposed to seat time. And uh, a coalition formed across the country, starting on the East Coast in Providence, Rhode Island, um, and, and going as far west as Oakland in California. And the researchers and the practitioners uh, came together and formed common principles. And those common principles included statements like uh, getting students to use their minds well, uh, creating a climate of decency and trust. Um, one of the key ones was a demonstration of mastery, and that is through culminating exhibitions or what we consider today to be capstone. Um, so Mike is not helping out here, but I don't know if I, maybe I can switch to the table. Okay. So you can see here that, uh, and we actually looked at the Coalition of Essential Schools uh, common principles as, thank you, as the design team uh, met and, and planned. And here in the mission statement, you see that it includes uh, so much of that possession of knowledge, skills, mindsets, competency to perform, and you can succeed in a variety of contexts. So, uh, tonight we're going to discuss uh, the structure that we, are, we have put in place for designing capstones. Uh, you'll hear another member talk about the sequence or the timeline, um, uh, as well as uh, starting in grade nine. Our current ninth graders will be the first uh, ninth graders that will actually complete a capstone. They're due to graduate in 2023. Um, you'll, you'll hear about the genres or the types of capstones that students will have an option to select from, as well as uh, the timeline for implementation. Uh, so there's a lot here. Um, at the end of the, the process, they will, the student will earn one credit, um, and we'll talk about how we have tried to build this in in a way that will help support students who may need some additional support in order to pull off a capstone uh, as, a, as a junior or a senior. So uh, with that said, I will now turn it over to Julie Parham, who will present how and when students will complete their capstone projects. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, happy Frank. So one of the first logistical problems we faced was how do we create a structure that will fit our wildly and wonderfully diverse community? Because we needed to have a shared structure, but we needed to be respective of all of the students in our district. And so we came up with, a, with three possible structures, and two of them actually overlap. So our vision is that most of our students will work on their capstone and discover their capstone through their pathway. Um, we imagine this may either be through classes that are offered with the pathway or special, special opportunities that are offered through individual pathways that are specific to that pathway. Um, we imagine that there will be an advisor within that pathway that is kind of determined by the pathway who will be helping students make choices and, and plan things out and helping support them along the way. Um, and actually, let's do, let's do examples now. So um, each of our principals will give an example of a pathway that could be at their school. Good afternoon, good afternoon evening, what are we doing? Because uh, I can't remember them all. I want to talk to you about our Digital Media and Communications Academy, which is also a pathway. And a couple of the courses we offer, journalism, broadcast journalism, photography, digital media, graphic design, film production, digital portfolio web design, and so students, in theory, at some point, will work along with the industry professional. And they will sit aside next to a web designer, a producer, TV producer, a content producer, internet producer, and then they will be his apprentice or her apprentice, and then produce a con and then get a certification in Adobe, um, it's one of the Adobe suites. And so the, the real thing they produce every week is a, a show. 
they produce the VC every week, and then once a month, we produce the pop rate. So part of it is that they show what they do each week, and then at the end of four years, have some sort of certification to stand for it. So we have a capstone-like experience already in place at the Norwalk Early College Academy. I apologize, my voice is going a little bit. Um, and soon will be, July 1 will be P-TECH Norwalk. So every year, students have an opportunity to participate in an eight-week uh, internship, paid internship with IBM. And we've had, in the past two years, we've had two groups of students who have done this. Uh, last year, we had 12 students who participated no, I'm sorry, 17 students who participated in an IBM internship. And it's a very competitive process. Students are required to submit their application and a proposal for what they'd like to do and how they'd like to spend their time. Prior to doing that, students have to have met the requirements for the capstone or for the internship. And that includes having, at least, uh, having earned at least 12 college credits. Some of those in the core areas as well as the computer science courses must have been completed. We also have a workplace readiness course called Workplace Learning, and students take that course freshman, sophomore, and junior year, and so they must have successfully completed the sequence before applying for the IBM internship. They must also apply and then have a, a mock interview and then a real interview with IBM managers, and those managers are looking for people who will have a value add to the company because these students are actually doing real work, working on design thinking teams and contributing to the teams that are in existence at IBM. Once the student is selected, if the student is selected by a manager, they are matched to a job that is of interest to them and the skill that they would bring to the team. And then the students also can participate in uh, AI. Uh, they have opportunities to participate and also uh, interface with Watson. The students do not have to necessarily be all in, uh, in the computer science arena. They can do something in HR, they can do something that relates to communications. So it really is about making sure that students have the, both the professional and uh, the professional skill set to have the value add to the company, but also be willing to possibly participate uh, in the following school year. So these are internships that can be extended. All students participate in an internship expo at the end of the summer. And so one of the things that we'll be working with the Capstone Committee to do is to make sure that that is a robust and rich experience, um, not just where the students are presenting, but they're really doing something that relates to the design that we've come up with as a Capstone Committee. Uh, good evening. So uh, at Brian McMahon High School, uh, you know, there's a number of different pathways that already exist uh, with, with built-in um, capstone experiences. One of them, for example, is uh, um, Project Lead the Way, which is engineering, also biomedical, um, and we're starting up a, a computer science pathway through PLTW. So those all have uh, culminating work that, that happens. And then what Tom's gonna talk to you about in a little bit is, is the career-related program for IB, which melds PLTW, also our NGROTC program, with uh, an IB program, so that's gonna be uh, a, a more kind of structured pathway that will present itself. Um, speaking of the NJROTC program, they're currently working with the protocol for National History Day, and they're coupling the, the values and principles of the NJROTC program with that protocol uh, for students to do research projects, uh, who, you know, the students who are in the NJROTC4 program. Um, the art, uh, art department, students create portfolios, they do, um, you know, a, a culminating galleries, so there's, there's structures already built in, it's just a matter of formalizing them. So in, in the departments and the pathways, those are being uh, uh, formalized at this time. One of the, one of the most well-developed uh, capstone experiences that exists at Brian McMahon right now is through the IB Diploma Program. And you know, in addition to taking six IB courses plus theory of knowledge, students in the IB have to do something called CAS, which is Creativity, Activity, and Service. This is during their junior and senior year. They have to um, you know, develop leadership skills and. Uh, create programs or, that involve creativity, activity, and service. So um, outside of the classroom, you know, development of the whole person. Um, there's also something called the extended essay. 
and extended essay starts uh, beginning of junior year, culminates uh, somewhere around the middle of senior year. So it's about a year and a half long research project. It's a uh, 4,000 word, 16 page uh, formal essay that the students write. And when they've completed their CAS and their extended essay, um, this past year we had our first CAS EE night. It was a celebration of the work the students had done up to that point and uh, you know, invited the community in and the students had, you know, we were set up a uh, science fair style and, and people came around and students presented their findings, uh, you know, what they learned uh, through those two projects. So those are a few of the ways that we're addressing Capstone at Brown Thank you. And at Center for Global Studies, our Capstones, we imagine, are going to be fairly specialized, we imagine. Uh, one of three possibilities, either a linguistic-based capstone that students achieve either through one of our normal two-week study tours or a longer study abroad opportunity. It might be a cultural capstone, which uh, could be done either through our um, cultural anthrop anthropology class, one of the new classes, social studies classes we're developing. It could be local, regional, or abroad. Um, uh, and it also could be through our civic engagement class that we will begin offering next year uh, to encourage students to be student activists and engaged in their community. It's very exciting. Um, that's the pathway. We, we imagine at least 85%, if not more, of our students are going to be achieving their, their capstone through the pathway. Yes, Mr. Chair. Could you give us, I don't know if this is, could you give us an example, some examples of a pathway and capstone in either someone who's really involved in uh, the humanities or history? Sure. If, if you wouldn't mind holding on for just a second, I think one of our later slides is going to talk about different genres of capstone. So even within the structure, there are going to be different options that students have. So they might be research-based, they might be performative, and I think that will, that will really speak to your question nicely. Um, we do have two other possible structures, and the next one is called the capstone seminar course, and Carol is going to tell you a little bit more about that. So students will elect to register or are registered by their school counselors. So in working with students, the advisors will see the students who are ready and have picked a project and who are ready to come to the table and are ready to take the course. And then we'll have the school counselors look at the students along with the advisor to see who needs that course put on their schedule and who needs a little bit more support in that area. The course curriculum is designed to offer additional supports for students. So embedded within the curriculum, we're gonna ensure that there are people along the way that will be very supportive to the students in the process. So for example, a student who's gonna be doing a performance or a musical piece, um, they're gonna have somebody in the school who's working with them along the way, but they also may have um, their violin teacher outside of school who will also be able to help them as well. So it's gonna be very much a team and, and community effort in that respect. Um, our course instructor, instructors will monitor, monitor the progress and approve the final product. Um, one of the things we spent time talking about on the committee was the importance of the people selected for the particular students. We had talked about that the, the people that are picked and, and associated with the student and assigned and, the, and the also too the people that the students pick is, are going to be just as important as the project that they pursue. Um, because we think that connection is going to help the student be more successful. Um, at the end of the capstone seminar course, they will the student will receive a letter grade and credit assigned for the course. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the independent study piece. Thank you. So it's very possible that a student could be working on their capstone with a pathway but need extra support and so then they would enroll in the capstone seminar course. They could enroll in that class once, twice, or three times, depending on how much support they need and how much time they need. Um, finally, we anticipate a very small percentage of our population having, you know, walking into 10th grade and having their capstone and they know what they want to do and maybe they've been dancing for 12 years and, you know, that's not really a curricular option at our school, but that's their passion and they have a mentor and um, they're ready to uh, do that as an independent study. They would submit a proposal, they would still have an advisor, uh, that would work with the school, and um, but we want to give them a little freedom to, to follow those passions as well. Uh, so next up, to tell us a little bit about how this might look over four years, because clearly this is a, a huge undertaking for students. This is not something that happens only in the 12th grade, uh, but Anthony is going to tell us more about the sequencing. Thank you very much. So when we began deciding on how we were going to structure the sequencing, we decided that two things were important that there were um, 
there were some common requirements that across all four secondary institutions in the city of Norwalk, there should be some common requirements that every institution will require in the same way. Um, alternatively, it's important that each institution is able to keep autonomy in what makes NECA special, and what makes CGS special, and what makes Norwalk High School special, what makes Brian McMahon special. So when we were coming up with this sequence, we decided to come up with a four-step plan that allows each institution to apply it to their students the best way that their institution feels uh, would foster this in their students, and at the same time, make sure that if I'm a grade 10 student in Norwalk High School, I'm in the same spot on my capstone as a grade 10 student at Brian McMahon. So we don't have students at all different steps at all different grades. Uh, it's important to be uniform. So um, additionally, there's uh, two more things. Uh, collaborative uh, creativity and critical thinking is two things that we're going to foster in grade nine. The transition to high school, how to be reflective, 21st century skills that NPS values, and general expectations for capstone are very uh, general words that speak to the skills that we want to foster in grade nine students so they can successfully propose and carry out a capstone project. So uh, those freshman experiences may look different in different programs, uh, as, in, as explained in the how section of the grade nine. Uh, but what's most important is that we are fostering equity across all learning levels. Uh, the idea of uh, growth with a proficiency in skill, the idea of independent learning experiences and being able to pursue a creative interest is something that's already being done at many high level programs in Norwalk Public Schools right now, but is lacking at the lower levels. If we apply a capstone program across the board to grade 9, 10, 11, and 12, it'll, sure, it'll ensure an equity of practice for all students in Norwalk Public Schools so that they'll all have equal access to curiosity, equal access to independence, and equal access to see their skills carry through from grade to grade, which I think some students don't see at the moment. So grade 10, uh, students will complete their benchmark on their digital platform. We have not decided what that digital platform will look like yet, but it will be a technology hub where students and advisors can log on and see where students are on their journey across their, plat uh, their capstone platform. Have they submitted their proposal? Has their advisor signed off on it? Things of that nature. Um, and they will be embedded in either advisory or their pathway courses. Now grade 11, this is where the rubber really starts to hit the road with the capstone project. So some students will complete the benchmarks on their digital platforms and may actually begin their capstone internships if that is the road that they choose to go on. So grade 11, they may begin presenting their final capstones in semester two. So if a student is ready by the second semester of junior year and they want to present before the busy uh, college application, prom, all the things that are going on senior year, and you have a student that's particularly ambitious and they would like to present their finished product semester two of their junior year, they may do so. So beginning grade 11, they will uh, have the ability to present their findings if their advisor feels they are ready to do so. Um, and then finally on grade 12, students will be completing their capstone um, and present their final capstone assessment. Now this is where um, the seat time comes in. Uh, if a student beginning in grade 11 is not where they need to be according to their advisor, then we would uh, require them to take a seat time capstone course to make sure that each student is getting uh, an ample opportunity to complete this program. So from grade nine, 10, 11, and 12, we have autonomy. We have core principles that are shared across all secondary programs. And most importantly, it offers equity to all students to pursue uh, interests and in their, um, their own flavor of the education throughout their high school experience. So next, we are going to go with uh, a chart that we have up here. slides also in front of you if you can't see it. Okay, so in about you know, 30 seconds, Dr. Maya is going to talk to you about the different um, genre that the cap capstones might fall under. And when she does that, it would be great if you have this image 
in, in the back of your mind. Because um, since not all capstones um, are going to fall under the same category, uh, we thought it was useful to have um, a collection of values um, in one place so that we could kind of you know, pin all the genres to, to that collection of values. Okay, so this image is um, a simplified overview of those values, is really the lens through which um, all of the genre can be filtered so that we can value them equally. I think you can see firsthand the, uh, the hours the committee has worked because the, the presentation, it has an elegance to it, right? But it's been hours of kind of chewing on some details. And always you can hear in the presentation this beautiful tension, right, about wanting quality and real evidence, but understanding that we want choice and responsibility. And those things sometimes come in tension as we design learning. So building that in was really important to us, that it was clear enough that that was a quality capstone, but flexible enough that we would be able to really elicit the love and the passion of each student. So one of the ways we think about that is not just that beautiful sequence of work over time, but we also think about that ending capstone being something more than a written paper, right? So what we've named those are the genres. What is the genre of a capstone? The genre is very important because that is the piece that ultimately is presented, ultimately critiqued, and ultimately tells you if you have passed your capstone, right? When we were talking about some of the support, we're preparing ourselves for the day that we have a student at graduation that's all but capstone, right? That we make sure that we have lots of support in there so that students can be successful with that final credit. In our genre that we're laying out, you're going to hear us talk about a genre of problem solving, a genre of internship, a genre of research-based and a genre of creative performance. So the question about a historic reference, a student may choose in their humanities work that they want to express their capstone in writing, and maybe they want to formalize a publication from their work. They, what we have is that we're putting together our process that says, what is the outcome you're trying to address? How will you answer that? Who will be the partner or mentor by your side? What national, international, or human standard will you use for excellence? And those are the pieces of the puzzle that we put together so that when a student uh, engages in a problem-solving capstone, we understand what would be the elements of that and what criteria that would be judged against. This may be used in maybe one of our, our STEM design pieces. This might be used in one of our business and economic pieces where they're really going to maybe solve one of those major problems of uh, future finance, for example. The second one, internship. Now here's one of the things we know. Some of our students like real world work and are engaged in internships. One of the examples we've talked about is the student who's uh, working in auto body, and that's one of their real loves and is part of their work-based learning. How do we help them work with an expert and craft an internship where they get those job readiness and learning skills and we can actually have them then reflect and talk about that internship? That's a capstone, right? Where we make that deep connection to their work. Another genre would be more research-based where students really want to engage in a deep problem of practice, where they want to be able to share their knowledge in maybe a, a multimedia presentation or a scientific research paper. The last one is this idea, too, that a capstone could be a creative performance, a demonstration that is done in multimedia, in the arts, visual and performing, and so that a student actually may elicit their own composition, that they may go through a design process, and they may actually perform that for a, a live audience that we can all reflect on the quality of that capstone and the process that the student went through. One of the things that we've shown here is it's product and process that we want to bring together to really show the deep thinking that the student has done during their capstone process. Bruce, did that answer a question about how we, we kind of we have multiple pathways 
But what we have are these cross-cutting features of quality that we use in each one of those. We, in each one of these um, the genres that you see, we're going to be working with best in class. We have some projects across the Connecticut, Skills 21, who's had about five years of work with multiple districts where we're looking at what are the exemplars of capstone? What's the criteria? How do we collect that work over time so it's not lost, so that we can all see that? And we'll be using them as our kind of a coach by our side and an accelerator as we move from hopefully this thinking to our now kind of detailed process for implementation. Sarah. So you started talking about what my question was, which is great. Um, speaking to the issue of parity across the district, I was just thinking about rubrics for assessment and how those would be consistent, particularly for something like a dance recital or an internship where your, your criteria for what's successful would be very different. You can imagine the entry point here is that you have to get your proposal approved. And that proposal is a standard document used across all genres, right? But that we know the elements, the deep thinking, the promise, and the timeline are in place, right? That's kind of a, a gives it a leveling feel. What we also know at the other end is that we want to have clear criteria when we say this is what it is. And part of that criteria is going to be some, some performance or representation with an outside audience, right? So that will be an element that we'll have to factor into each one of our genres. What is the name of the um, group that is working? Skills 21. Skills 21. It's out of one of our regional agencies to the north. They've been working with districts across the state. They actually host kind of a, a capstone fair, um, and they actually have their own kind of course. What we've decided to do, because of our kind of clear vision of work and the flexibility we'd like to see in Norwalk, we're going to be using their toolkit and laying that against our design theory. Um, so those tools that have already been developed and tested, it'll help to accelerate us a bit. Let me turn it back over to Frank. He can go through the timeline. Thank you, Brenda. So this is an ambitious timeline. Um, when, you know, as uh, Dr. Myers pointed out, the process that goes into a, an eventual culminating exhibition um, requires a lot of work. And so. Uh, between now and the summer of 2019, you can see what we've set out to do here. Uh, we are partnering with Skills 21. We'll have a digital uh, platform in place. Most importantly here, there will be a representative or two from each of the four high schools that will sit down and actually develop the curriculum um, for the capstone, uh, as well as a capstone guidebook. Come back in the fall 2019, curriculum office uh, and operations will help um, working on PD for all high school teachers. All high school teachers are gonna have skin in the game um, because every student will have an advisor and they'll need to make a proposal before they can begin the process. Um, we'll introduce this idea of a capstone requirement through our advisories. And then in the spring of 2020, you can see here, uh, our program of studies would be updated again to reflect all of the design work that we do between now the time of that publication. Uh, there'll be ongoing curriculum development for the capstone seminar course. We think there could be hundreds of kids that are uh, taking a capstone seminar course that need a teacher two or three days a week to help develop over the course of the semester that culminating exhibition. And then spring of, 2020, of 2023, our first North Public School class earns a capstone. Uh, so with the exception of there will be some uh, juniors in that class that will probably be high flying and will be able to uh, demonstrate mastery and, and provide a capstone in the spring uh, 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 semester of the junior year. Uh, by and large, most of our students will do that um, in their senior year, either in the fall or in the spring. Any uh, final questions? Uh, can I have, can we have one, one quick question? Is that okay now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, I guess my one question, I, I really appreciate the, the different pathways, especially the emphasis on internships and possible work experience. I think that's, that's a great opportunity for our students. I am wondering, uh, and maybe I missed it, but was, have students been consulted on this, given their opinions to help create the, the plan moving forward and, and kind of what are their reactions? 
we have not, we have uh, not held any uh, specific focus groups, but we relied on our school uh, leaders and uh, teachers and counselors who are on the task force to bring uh, their their instincts and their uh, previous experiences working with students. Um, and me uh, individually, uh, as a high school principal, was one of uh, the earlier schools in New Haven to develop uh, a capstone experience through the arts. Um, and so we had pathways in uh, dance, creative writing, uh, visual arts, theater, etc. cetera. And uh, each student uh, demonstrated uh, a capstone during their senior year. Uh, it was a public exhibition, generally had 50 to 100 uh, audience members that participated. And all of the work that happens between that endpoint and where we are now are the things that we're talking about. Developing a common set of rubrics, having a, a high standard across the board, I think I heard Anthony say. Giving students uh, access to the same level of rigor, the, the same high expectations, um, and providing them with the opportunities through the four years to develop and, and work toward that final project so that it's not something that's falling out of the sky in uh, the fall or the spring of their senior year. So I, I would encourage that um, as this is rolled out and implemented, that kind of each year, especially for the first couple of years during implementation and rollout, that some um, connections with students, and, and I'm not sure they need to be formal focus groups, but reach out to student governance bodies or something to do some kind of student check-ins on seeing how implementation is or are there ways to, to improve the, the program and, and the, um, the requirements. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And, and one of the ways that we'll really begin to utilize student feedback uh, will be in the first year of the capstones. Um, we used to have freshmen and sophomores intentionally invited to the exhibitions to be able to witness their, their upper class uh, friends present, go through the experience, um, and they, those underclassmen would provide us with experience, with their feedback on how we could further improve the process when they became seniors. Okay, Barbara. <laughs> um, I just uh, kind of piggybacking or extending from what Julie was asking. Um, so we have this grade, ninth graders who haven't had the embedded lessons. Are we gonna go back and put that in their advisory in the 10th grade so that they don't miss that piece? The answer is yes, and I missed it. No, you didn't miss it, but it's, it's a very good question. So we have a, we have a gap closing feature, right, because we had nine graders and some of the elements they had, but we're going to have to do is we're going to have to align in each one of our schools for our 10th grade class next year. Some of the components they would have gotten in the ninth grade course, so we're going to have to catch that up as we move forward. Great. And if we could have a communication, I've already had some parents express, express anxiety to me that they don't exactly know what this is. If we could have a at the end of this school year so that they know what to anticipate and they're not anxious about it. That would be very helpful. Thank you. I have one more question, actually. Um, oh, hi, Neil. Oh, I'm sorry. No, do you want to go first? Jinx. No, no, I'll just go. I'll take go it. first. Right. This is great, though. All that we're doing, I know that's been a long time and coming, and we applaud all of you for all of your hard work. But question, and this is directed Reginald, if you could answer this for um, digital media studies and it's flourishing. We've been a lot more students, which I know of. Um, how are we also, and piggybacking on what my colleagues are saying, getting the word out as far as a capstone for a digital media studies program? They, well, they just spent some time at the middle schools yep. to okay. get them into the class in, in the program, and then they, they're good at communicating. Excellent. So are we having our students? Go to our middle schools, or is it like Rob Carl? Rob goes, Mr. Seabird goes, uh, Mr. Franco goes. So teachers show up, students show up, and then they communicate with parents that way. Okay, so the teachers are going, did you mention, I'm sorry if I missed that, students are going with some and of the teachers? taking the student into class. Okay, because I think that's critical. I mean, that's the key part. Having teachers go, I think it's great, but having it come from actual students and presenting and talking about what they've been learning, whether it's on the conference or some of the classes that they're taking, right. I think would be really helpful for our middle school kids that are in eighth grade and then transitioning over to ninth grade. I think it's the advertising almost in a way and kind of getting the word out will get our students really motivated and excited to take this on for some of our students. Yes, thank you. Part, part of what they think they, they call themselves marketing masters, so 
So they've been going to middle schools, going to Paris, you name it, campus cleanup, you'll probably hear something about digital media Saturday when we do our campus cleanup. So it's everywhere. Which is great. I don't think you can get the word out. You'll have siblings that'll talk about it, but you'll have friends that will talk about it as well. But I think getting the active student input and how it's been going, I think it's particularly important to that that's happening. I know we do that also for our camps as well. Kind of getting the word out at some of the great programs that we have in our middle schools when they're transitioning over. Uh, we don't send, we haven't sent students over middle schools. Okay. We send adults, but then we hold facial sessions okay. where we invite the parents and students and the other students to the program. And, and how do you get holding the connection of the power of the capstone? Uh, Frank had mentioned that the requirement is not necessarily legislated. Right. But what a powerful way to entice yeah. students into programming when they see capstones and they can see what the work looks like over time. Right. That's going to be really one of our best selling points. Students to own students, really powerful work. I agree. And I think a lot of our families are learning about all these programs that we have, but when we're getting out there, as you both have mentioned, getting to our middle schools, talking about and having these informational you know, seminars or programs really entices parents to have more knowledge and understand what's happening. And then that next level up for high school for them. And I think it kind of eases some of their concerns. Um, what I was going to say was, uh, Frank, you had said that when you you had like a capstone, what did you say? I forget the word you used. It was a you Expo, know, culminating something. exhibition. But where the uh, incoming students were able to see that. And right. so because we don't have the ability to do that because we haven't had any capstones yet, I'm wondering if there's a way to um, include that exhibitionary piece from other, for example, the the partner organization. Yeah, so one of the pieces, Skills 21 provides us what we call the capstone exemplar. Oh, great. Right? So students have gone before us, some very solid work. Many of us attended actually the seminar where three or four of the students shared their capstone. That's going to give us a little library of what good looks like. And that will be, students will be able to see that coming in? Okay. The other, the other goal is that the, the juniors in this class, some of the real, you know, high-flying juniors, will have uh, done their culminating exhibitions in the junior year, mm -hmm. those capstones could really serve as models to the senior class. I mean, we will have some really outstanding work uh, in the spring semester of their junior year, and those can really serve as models um, for the senior class. Yeah. Well, just to note, we had our capacity meeting uh, for IT students. The current juniors came to see what the, the finished products have been. Interested sophomores who aren't doing anything culture around capstone is, is so new that people don't, but I think as it builds, these will become you know, big kind of uh, community uh, events with a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. That's where the real nitty gritty of what's going to happen should come. I'm not sure it's the healthiest thing for a 14 year old to say, yeah, I like what that kid did, although I, it may not have any interest in anything that led up to that. Uh, so I, I think on the one hand it is beneficial, but I think the ideas and the goals and the projects and stuff, they have to emerge through the pathway because that's going to be the key to everything. If the pathways are really done right, they're imaginative, they're interested, interesting. Then I think the end products will reflect that. If the end products don't reflect that, then it's the pathways we have to look at and, and how they're being taught. Oh, I just wanted to thank Bruce and the curriculum committee and staff for your hard work on this. I know it's a long time coming. When I was at Arcai, my capstone was at the beach. 
Thank you very much, and thanks everyone who um, contributed to this. You know, um, we are we are not the first in Connecticut to do this, and there have been um, many fine, mostly suburban school districts ahead of us in terms of the 25 credits and the capstone requirement. But the advantages we've had, uh, you've had, is the opportunity to look at that work uh, and do something better, take it to the next level, and you appear from your recommendations to have done that. And I'm very, very grateful to you for that. Thank you. Great. Okay, so let's move on to 3B. Yeah, so 3B is directly related to this. And again, it was one of those things that we had mentioned when you approved the program of study that would be coming to you uh, later and at this uh, time. I think we also mentioned that uh, we were able to obtain uh, some private funding and assistance from the Heidenreich <coughs> Foundation for uh, the development <coughs> of this uh, career-related re uh, pathway. Now, this is an IB career-related pathway, which probably causes a big question mark in everybody's mind. What is an IB career-related uh, pathway? So, here to explain all of that is the man with the answers, who has uh, played a, uh, uh, a very integral role in, uh, in uh, creating this opportunity for our students, which is Tom Such. Uh, first of all, to follow up on your question about you know, the exposition type stuff, um, again, my department is a, a bunch of guinea pigs for me, so we're actually you're also getting invited for part of our final for our honors bio students. They're doing a, a symposium. If you Google college symposium, university symposium, every university does this. It's not just science, it's, it's in psychology, it's in music, it's in dance, whatever. So we're trying to model it and test that out. So for part of our final, we've been working on the last month some bacteria work, and they're going to present their ideas. I'd love to have you guys show up. We're going to have about 100 projects laid out here. So keep that data to so. All right, so I'm going to hopefully give you a, a paint a little picture about our IB career related program. Um, if you're familiar with our IB program, we are an IB World School. As part of that certification, we have the opportunity to become authorized to, to provide the IB career related program. We're in the midst of authorization. Uh, the first process was an application phase, then a consultant phase. Our consultant phase literally ended last Friday. Our consultant writes a report. It's kind of like a NEASC report where they're assessing all our aspects of can we do this. That report goes to IB International and they'll give us the results of that in three weeks. So Bertie told me we should be happy with the results, but again, we won't put that out there just yet. Then we had next year to really make it happen. So this is for it starting of 2020 year. So next year, that's when we do our training, that's when we get all our curriculums taken care of, all our, our course book outlines, and so on and so forth. So, so we're really excited about this. So this is hopefully going to be the 10,000 foot level viewpoint, and I'll bring it down to maybe the, the 500 level. We won't get down and dirty on it, because um, it will move up at that. Uh, this, uh, and again, that 10,000 foot level, it all comes down to this. It all comes down to giving us our kids those experiences, those, those opportunities to explore those that they have interest in. All right, this young lady who's a sophomore over at NCC, uh, a sophomore, our sophomore over at NCC, learning these procedures, you're not gonna get that from a Chromebook. You're not gonna get that from an iPad. You're definitely not gonna get it from a Google Classroom. So giving them the experience so they know what they're gonna end up doing. So again, 10,000 foot. Goals of the IDC, they love their acronym. So I apologize up front, you're gonna see a lot of acronyms. CP, Career Related Program. Um, it's a combination of the academics and with those career studies. And what those career studies are, what we give, you know, provide them as interest points. These are 13 year olds coming in. They don't know exactly what a health field is. They don't know what exactly uh, marine science fields and so on. We need to provide those opportunities. We need to spark those interests. All right. With those interests, we want those children to be ready for it. We want them to be confident with it. All right. This young lady, the young lady is doing the blood pressure on a dummy. All right. Well, we want to be confident. We want to have those good communication skills. So these are those overarching. <coughs> 10,000 foot level ideals that we want to have with the kids. Right? A word I've been using a lot lately, and I apologize, but I love this word is resilience, and we don't do a good enough job of it. All right? Resilience is part of this process. If 
ability for a child to bounce back, the ability for a child to learn from what they've gone through, and take it to the next level. We need to continue to push that envelope. We're in the midst of IV testing here. There's a lot of stress in this building. IV testing, AP testing. We've got to build that, that, that ability to, be, to handle that long before now, long before they're seen. So that's a big piece of it. It's IV, international mining. Obviously a big ticket item here. This is definitely something. These are Norwalk kids. I was a Norwalk kid. They got to realize it's no longer just this community. It's the community of Norwalk. It's the state of Connecticut. Keep going. It's international. We have to expose that to them. But even with that, they have to understand their connection to the community. Right? Where, you know, they have to understand that they can give back to the community. Give them the opportunity. This young man who's a junior in our marine bio class, he was tasked to develop a, a lesson uh, on the ecosystem of Sheffield Island. We took him, his class out. The younger students there, those are all related to fifth grade. So he was tasked to enlighten them on, on the ecosystem. Not sure who learned the most. The high school students or the fifth grade. So, so taking it down, 10,000 feet, let's go down to 5,000 feet. The, the basis framework here, there's three major elements of this process. There's a couple subcategories in here, so I'm going to try to keep it straightforward, but you know, I apologize if, if I lose you somewhere along the way. It is pretty it's pretty cool when you look at it from the standpoint of a child. Right? Kid comes in, the big thing this is IB. Alright, there are academic courses. These students can take those IB diploma classes. Now our IB diploma kids, as, as Scott said, they take six IB classes and their schedule is pretty lock set. You know, there are priority scheduling wise. Barbara Wood is dealing with our scheduling. Number one priority is going to the IB those things can't move. With IBCP, they're taking just two of them. But they are taking ones that are more focused on their choice of career or their career study. So an IB diploma student will take a science and math and physics and so on. But if we have a kid who's doing the healthcare academy and has taken that track, his IB courses might be the IB biology and the IB health physiology course. If it's an engineer student, if it's a kid who's doing our, our PLW engineering track, they can take the IB physics and a high level IB math course. So that ties right into it. So, uh, excuse me, that, yeah. job, that student would graduate without biology? Without? Without biology. The biology freshman course, though. I, I'm sorry, IB is still a, a junior and senior program. So, our, if I was coming in here and I want to follow the engineering track, I would take bio as a freshman, chemistry as a sophomore. My junior year, if I'm, if I'm in this program, I could take the IB physics. But honestly, we also have students who are not in the IV diploma program, they're going to take IV certificate program, so we'll take the IV physics course. Well, we're, well, we're, and again, I'm being very biased as a science teacher, our kids need physics. We cannot let kids get out of this building without physics somewhere. Because even if, even the medical kid needs physics. If you want to look into nursing programs anywhere in the Northeast, you're looking for physics as a high school student. So we have to, we have to be able to handle that. So this is our academic aspect of it that ties into when they're a junior or senior year. The second part is called the core. This is the, the, the glue that bonds everything together. And the core has a couple different components or parts. I want to hit each of them a little more specific. But this is where it really ties in that career with that, with that uh, academic aspect. It also ties in that, that personal skill. It also ties in going towards the capstone. It also ties in community, and community work and so on and so forth. So I want to talk briefly on each four of the, of the four here. Um, the first one is personal and professional skills. All right, this is an actual IV course, so we have to have people trained for it. I sent a teacher off to get trained in January, so she's certified through IV. We needed that for our, our process of getting uh, accredited for um, the program. We look forward to having a few more going out next year in that phase. Yes? Can you, I know we're not going lower than 500 feet, but just can you broadly explain exactly what they, what the curriculum, what are they reading, what are they doing? The teacher going for it or the course? No, the course. I want to know okay. what the students are experiencing at the end. We, we haven't taught it yet because we're not authorized. Right. However, to be all honesty, the key thing here is workplace learning. Karen was talking about the workplace learning course. Very, very similar. Right? The same concept where you're preparing a child for that workplace environment. So whether it's interviewing skills, whether it's terminology, so the plan is to have a teacher per, our tra per track, per pathway. So for our healthcare pathway, 
the students will learn medical terminology. They'll learn the ethics of being in, in a hospital situation or in a medical field and so on and so forth, that kind of concept. So it's very specific, but it's in with a set of, of, of curriculum that follows them through so they're prepared for a workplace learning, how to fill out a job application. Like they have that books that they're reading or articles, like is, are we going to have something sort of so tangible? With, so with this, there is a curriculum mm -hmm. that we would adopt as, as we go forward. There are a few, IB prov provides a few publications for it. We actually are reviewing it right now. And as we go through this process, we have a consultant. There's also a school that we're partnering up with down in New Jersey, going back and forth of what is the best resource. Um, and again, it's, it also is going to be site visits. It's going to be involved going places. It's going to be going, let's, let's go to our hospital. Let's go to NCC. Let's find out that. Let's go to, you know, Work with Neil Constantine, who helped us a lot with our engineering pathways, especially our life. Let's go visit that facility. So, there, there will be a course open generated, but you know, it's not. I guess you say here it is do exactly this when you do Right. Uh, it's, you know, there's an overview, you know, there's a structure that you provide. So, you know, there will be a course that will be created. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that would be a language development aspect. The fourth part is reflective process. You just heard an awesome presentation. Okay, so you saw an awesome new, uh, presentation. That's what this is. The reflective project is a pathway project. And so when we're talking about, when Karen was up here talking about the certain pathways and how it would fit and how it would basically take care of that, that's what this is. You know, so they would have to develop it in their process as well. And those are all components. That's the second part. They have the academic part, and now they have the core. The missing part is their pathway. We have career-related pathways. Again, IE, love their action, CRS. So our career-related pathways, students are engaged in a pathway that they've chosen or they've been exposed to. We want to celebrate that and we want to push that in this process. So that pathway that they built from one year to the second year, third year, ties right in. So it's woven into those VP courses, it's woven into their core. The kids here, those are the engineering kids. They're in their third year of our engineering pathway, our, our digital time. That's our robotics club. That is on the regional competition. Of. Well, that's an example of these kids are going through that pathway. The pathway is actually going to be part of our program, our, our PLTW pathways. We have biomedical, we have our engineering, and we have our computer science that we started this year. As a, as a plug for this, this school, we are the only school in the Northeast that has all three PLW pathways. I can't say that starting in September because two schools in Massachusetts are starting to make it. So it's good to be for me. Um, in addition, is our Navy Junior ROTC class. And the elephant in the room, if, if I asked you what group is gonna be the, you know, the ones that are lining up for IV, that probably wouldn't be your choice. They are the most successful group in the state of Florida under CP. Think about how, how involved they are from day one in our ROTC program. Whether it's at our at man or our it doesn't matter. They're involved. They're involved in community service. They're, they're, they're involved in, in outreach. They're involved all over the place, and that's the one that's actually one of the most successful, so we're very much looking forward to that. Those are the ones we started with because those are certified by an outside source. That's one of the gatekeepers. So we need to, we need to make sure our pathways are, someone else is checking the box for us and saying, hey, this kid is prepared for a college experience. This kid is prepared for a, a work environment. So that's how we need to do this. These are the no-brainers. We wanted to start with a good number, but we also didn't want to go crazy. Obviously, these are our pathways. Our academies are part of this. Our healthcare academy definitely fits in because it has projects either way as well. Our marine science academy, academy is being designed with this in mind. So I'm going to kind of transition a little bit into that to give you a little bit of an update on that. Uh, we're in the process of rolling this out. Next year, we have our first cohort. We have two sections, about 50 kids signed up for it. Um, and we do have 10% coming from, from our, our non traditional feeder schools. So it's kind of a we're still figuring out the schedules. You know, we're still in the process of that. Um, it is very much supported by a lot of partnerships. It's amazing how many partnerships have, have come to us looking to help. Um, I'm very much impressed with that. I'm going to talk a little bit about those. But it's not marine biology. And that's kind of the disclaimer here. You will see it's always marine biology. And I taught marine biology for 20 some odd years. It's more than that. It's the industry. It's the marine industry, the transportation industry. The shipping industry, the headquarters of most global shipping industries are less than 10 miles from this building right now. All right, and that's what we want to capitalize on. Those are the folks that are really jumping into, into us and trying to help because they need the work on that. So key components, again, disclaimer, because if you remember a couple years ago, we talked about medical academy, they're similar. All right, but the reality is the key components should be the same. You want that uniform. And again, a disclaimer, a lot of this is based off of the model I, I, I get from the, the agricultural students. The, the ag schools have to lead out the first two years of more exploratory, and then they really focus in on that junior and senior year. But the key things here, these are you know, some of the key components, the integrated curriculum, the collaboration, the getting out there and getting the field experiences, the college level courses, whether IV courses, or project lead away courses, those are college level courses, <coughs> and certain aspects of certification. If you want to focus in a few, more specifically, the integrated curriculum. <coughs> the first line there is probably the most important thing, increasing student engagement, all right? By, it, by integrating that curriculum, by taking that biology course and that marine studies course and having those teachers work together and having those kids work together in those classes, 
And this type of, of learning, if you can make this happen, a lot of the other stuff you spend time with on a day goes away. Discipline issues go down. Attendance goes up. Academic success goes up. You know, being able to, to apply to different levels goes up. So, so we're very, really focused on student engagement on that. We really want to get into the technology aspect. It's not just going to work at a doc. Nothing wrong with that. It's not just going to work at, on, on, you know, on a deck of a boat. Nothing wrong with that, but there are other opportunities that we want to exert in the coast. Again, to break that mold of, oh, it's free biology. Uh, folks on student center learning, we've been doing that for a long time here. All right, we started with Nellie May as a support group, Nellie May Foundation, uh, the Center for um, uh, Secondary School Reform, a big proponent of that. Uh, we're very, very glad to be working with that. So we're going to continue that student center approach. The internship program was discussed earlier. Again, it's that global battle program going forward and again, how to get a the project. So that curriculum, which that's where it has to be developed, and that's where we have to look at it and make it our own. It's not where, you know, turn page one, then turn page two. No, we take that from, from ID, we work it on our own. The, these curriculums we are developing, we had a team this summer, again, sponsored by the, the, the Heinrich Foundation that got together as a team of science teachers, math teachers, guidance counselors, PE health teachers, want to look at it from a different perspective on that. Field experiences, all right, that's critical. What troubles me most is I'll see a, kid, a student in the hallway, and what class are you going? I'm going to science. Well, science isn't, you know, it's not a location. It's a subject matter. It's an experience. We have to get these kids out there. We have to get them in the field. They have to see what's going on. They have to see what's out in the real, quote, unquote, real world to get them experience. Um, so much of their interpersonal skills, that communication, Collaboration has to stop in the field. Uh, we're looking for the internship opportunities and obviously employment opportunities. We want our children to go out if they choose to work right out of high school, there's nothing wrong with that. If they choose to go to college, there's nothing wrong with that. Doesn't mean every kid's going to go to college when they're 18 years old. So a lot of students now have to work. And that's what we're looking for. Talk briefly on the partnerships. We're very, very pleased with this. Um, the Maritime Aquarium is, is always been a partner. Right now, they're on, you know, their, their leadership is not quite in place to keep you know, they keep uh, going through that process. Their focus right now is Walkbridge. So we've got to tread lightly. Um, be kind with SUNY Maritime. Uh, SUNY Maritime was put onto, onto the radar a little bit from my own personal experience, my own children, but also from the Heinrich Foundation and the Maritime Association. SUNY Maritime, 32 minutes away from here. Mass Maritime, a little further. Maine Maritime. I did some research on our kids going to high from here to those Maritime Academies. In the last five years, we've had six students apply. And of those six students apply, two went in. We've got to, we've got to make that partnership strong. Because SUNY Maritime, if you leave SUNY Maritime with a bachelor's degree, 100% job placement. And you are the sixth highest paid salary for undergraduate degree. Starting salary is $69,700 per year. That means MIT, that means Yale, that means Harvard, that means RIT. So these kids need to have that as an opportunity. And between the scholarship opportunities and our partnerships with the American Maritime, uh, Maritime Association, we can make that happen. So we've got to, we've got to get more involved with that. Cobb's oysters, Bloom's oysters are kind of interchangeable as the rank of the world who knows that. Uh, Seaport Association, huge, huge partnership. They will probably do well than you. They have now a mission. Their mission is to get every kid in Norman Public Schools on that island at some point in their, in their school career, free of charge. When their boat's in the water, it's available to them. Doesn't matter when, doesn't matter how, and there's no cost. They want to do that for kids. They want to get kids out there. They would love to get all of our staff out there. All right, because this is a resource for Norwalk. When growing up in Norwalk, you yeah, had to go out to the island. When you were at the beach, we probably went to the island. We weren't legally on the island. I was studying naval architecture. Yeah, <laughs> That's what you were doing. That's what you saw. Um, but no, no, no yeah. curriculum. They, they were. So we need this. They're incredible. They actually invited us to their gala uh, last week. And after my colleagues and I spoke to them and worked the room, they said they made the most money they've ever had because it's all about the kids. So we're very much involved in that. We want to get that not just at our school. We want to spread the world on that. Um, the Maritime Association Education Foundation. This is a group 
Uh, again, Heintritz are very, very much involved in this, and they put us on this. Um, they are the, the name's kind of a misleading name, Connecticut Maritime Association. They are the global leader in shipping. And so, with their resources, we actually invited them here, I got a slide on that. Um, but they've been extremely helpful in lighting our students on that. And so, that's what we can have to be. Trifecta Ecosystems is also a partner. We're going to have an aquaculture problem, uh, program here. They would love to be in the city. They would love to have Norwalk as one of their resources. We actually met in, in, in this process with them and stepping stones that they want to bring in. So our kids will be involved in this industry, which is growing very, no pun intended, but growing uh, astronomically around this area uh, for that. Again, reducing the carbon footprint, getting our food locally versus having it come off I-95 and 18, 18, 18. Um, As I mentioned, CMA, so they came and visited us in here in this room. I had about 40 juniors and seniors, and they were explaining the jobs and roles and how they did this. Most of them graduated from SUNY or Mass or Maine, and how they, you know, what they're doing in their career. One young lady, she was probably in her mid 20s. Again, that IV connection. She's fluent in seven languages, and that was so important for her job. And so having that connection and having our kids realize, oh, I should know a different language. I should. This, this is going to help. Things like that are powerful. This is the research vessel from, from SUNY. Again, our kids will be playing around that. Um, the aquarium got a, a, a sizable grant, so we incorporate them as well, and some of our, our feeder schools have gone there as well, the resilience program. So we're, again, we're working on that partnership, but right now they're, they're a little stressed. So um, we'll leave that one alone for today. Um, you mentioned ROTC. They have a, because we're a Navy ROTC program, um, they have a underwater robotics program called Sea Perch. Uh, part of our design for our facility, I've incorporated a, a few 400 gallon tanks so they can be built, tested, competed against, and then it's a national competition, or regional and national, where these kids get together. It's, it's a robotics competition underwater. So that's part of the program. Have I lost you yet? No. Yeah. So, so some of our, our courses, it's pretty straightforward. Again, typical high school scheduling, you're competing for everything. So we're starting off next year, we, we have marine studies in our coursework. And marine studies course, that's that cohort with 50 kids to be involved in. It is very intentionally written as marine studies. Not necessarily for the first one, not marine science, but marine studies. State Department of, of Education, science is very precise with certification. Because it's our vision, our goal, this second one is not taught necessarily by science by a math teacher, right? making in that connection. Because it can't be a one department show here. It can't be one group. That's why in our curriculum committee that bring in all these other subjects, because we want that part of it. Does that comply with our policy that we just passed? That you had to have biology and chemistry? Well, you still have bio. Bio is freshman. Chemistry is sophomore. Oh, they're taking yeah. both these guys. Yes. This on a, in a block schedule. Not in either or. Right. So like my medical kids take biology and principles of biomedical science. My right. engineers kids take biology and intro to engineering. Right. So. But the beauty of your brain studies is that it's a STEM class. As mm -hmm. they don't into those STEM classes. Mm -hmm. Well, I hate to say it, but it checks the box. Yeah. It shouldn't be about that. But again, I, want, I don't want it to be perceived as, oh, this is a science. It must be biology. No, it's a career. When I went down to, to the CMA, uh, one of their um, offices down in Stanford, I thought I walked into Google. I mean, it was an unbelievable office because, and that's that's the marine industry. So you have to show them. You get to them. So, um, I threw a couple slides in here, and not, not, nothing other than just, I don't want to say fillers, but some of the things we keep trying. Again, I, I grew up in my department, and I love them, and, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll go to the ends of the earth for me. but. Probably get a little annoyed after a while. But they do things, for instance, our marine bio group, you know, we want to see that student taking charge. And if you walk into our marine bio class or in my engineering classes or our, our medical classes, you will be hard to find a teacher. They're there, but they're not in front of a room. They're not me right now. I hate this concept because I'm not going to use you a walker. Um, but the kids are involved. The kids are designing. This tank that's here, I know there's only the here. That's intentional. The kids, the tank that's right around the corner here, the kids want to put a tank in here. They will put 
look at this over We have the text over here. They wanted one in the library. They designed what they wanted. They put a saltwater tank and a Long Island Sound tank in here. So last week there was crab, there was monk chugs and killifish and those around and all talking about. And then literally last week, they're like, it's time for a change. They want to make a tropical event. So they literally, the last couple of days, are switching it over. It's all on them. They're responsible for figuring out what goes in, the salinity, the pH, and all that. It's all on them to design that. So it's kind of neat to see that from a student's perspective. The teachers are just trying to facilitate. Yes. Are you hooked in with the guy at the aquarium who was just certified as the only person in the state or whatever at the Marine, at the Maritime Aquarium? He's a level three water quality expert now. Well, again, and then, you know, this is a public forum. I don't want to go too. Ah, we're, okay. we're, we're working on certain aspects of it. Great. You know, so, I just I saw that yeah. button. Well, and, 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 and they did great. I mean, Tom Natum and his team, the educators there, have been wonderful. Uh, we've done some research on what they can handle and what they can do. For instance, one of the things I want our kids to have the opportunity to talk about certification is to have a professional captain's license. And it can be done for high school kids. It's the hours, it's the calls, it's the training. We're going to get there. But right now, they're, we're, trying to, we're trying to wait until the leadership shows up you know, and let them figure that out. I don't want to put more stress on them. I'm sorry, Marine Studies one this time. So you purposely set it out as a freshman and sophomore course uh -huh. for that reason. And whether we're talking about the marine science, the medical, the engineer, computer science, when we went to the middle schools, as Reginald was saying, going to schools, we go and do our, our, our show and they come here during our, our academic night and so on. We mention all this because the reality is, okay, this is for we're, we're gonna be a we're gonna be certified for our 2020 year. Kids that are currently freshmen are going to be our first cohort. Kids who are eighth graders right now will be our second cohort. So even though we don't have it, they can be part of it. And it was part of the marketing. When we went to school, you were talking about you know, the pathways. We were talking about IBC kids. You know, we actually have a, uh, you know, Nicole Stockbridge, who is the DP coordinator. You know, her and I would put together and, and hit that for that purpose. Before. So there is that aspect. Because again, and going back to the discussion of, you know, I model this after the Schools. We don't know what a 13-year-old knows. And a 13-year-old doesn't know what a 13-year-old knows. And I guarantee you some of us didn't know what we were doing in college. So to pigeonhole them in that, you've got to get the on-ramps and the off-ramps. You've got to give them the opportunity. You know what? And the perfect example, I have a student who mother thanked me because her daughter dropped out of her health care attack. Thank you. Because at that point, the daughter realized this is not for me. It's a very inexpensive choice right now. A couple of years later, not so much. So we made provisions for that. Um, our, our current marine bio class, we've been test piling a lot, used a lot of things in there. We'll probably bring in, uh, we'll try to propose a marine technology course next year. We'll see how it goes with budgetary aspects and so on. Every good thing, I want as many students as possible to be able to decide if they'd like to. So that's it. Me. Right, so. I wish I had this opportunity. Right. <laughs> Northeast. It's, it's, it's slow to come up here. If you go anywhere, you know, 
Uber or South, it, it, it's very, you know, it's very apparent that they have it going on. But I think it's not meant to be for just your top kids. It's meant to be for all kids. And that's what we really want to focus on, that every kid has this opportunity. And yes, it's a junior senior program in, 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 our, in our, uh, our, our rural school. And we don't have a middle year program or, or a primary program. Yet. Yet. Yes. But the nice thing about this is the, the project lead away courses, the marine studies courses, the values and, and the fundamentals of IB, will they be embedded into those courses? Oh, you bet you. And so as a freshman, Hence that, 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 that symposium we're going to do with our freshmen is to get them the idea of that. And I literally have hijacked the IB uh, rubric to use for that, for that um, symposium. So, you know, it's not quite slap in the face to give them everything on IB, but it's the subtle movement towards it. Because the reality is, being an IB world school, it's, it's a pretty powerful tool for it. So I think um, I think the um, some of the developmental costs. I think you received was it fifty thousand from the uh, Heinrich Foundation. Right. So the Heinrich Foundation gave us fifty one thousand, basically a startup grant, and so we've been utilizing that this year, uh, and that supported teacher training, workshops, curriculum development for the Marine Studies One, uh, some of the equipment to test out, and quite honestly, some of the transportation issues. You know, because even though I can get for free on a boat, I still got to get it. So we want the program, you know, once it's, it's expensive to develop, obviously, but once it is developed, we want it to be able to run on the per student allocation for Brian McMahon plus the $1,000 that you provide for uh, choice magnet programs, because this will be open to uh, citywide, uh, very similar to some of uh, our other. Uh, with, with class service, this is choice, not magnet. Uh, this is, um, this will be. Well, yes, it's a choice program, but for those programs where we have a pathway only in one school, and it's a, you know, it's a high-end pathway, um, we do provide transportation. So, Ralph, I'm going to try to get all of these correctly. Um, the um, the uh, digital media at Norwalk High School is one. Um, uh, P-Tech Norwalk is, is another. And Brian McMahon is the Health Sciences Academy. It will be the Marine Sciences uh, Academy and the IB program. Now those five programs are open uh, district-wide. They are like the um, intra-district magnets at the elementary level in that respect. So they get the, the $1,000 for to support their, their uh, additional program costs and transportation is provided for the students. Do you think that $1,000 will cover what you So I want to thank uh, Frank and uh, Brenda and Tom and everyone who has worked on this effort. With your blessing now. Yeah. I just re I received a text from Mayo Brewing, who is really sorry. He want he, he 
his calendar didn't indicate that the meeting was here. And he went to City Hall, and he is interested in the capstone programs. And uh, I sent him the, the attachments, but whatever we can provide him, he'd appreciate it. He, he's sorry he couldn't make it. Okay, so um, we're, we're going to be pursuing this with your blessing now, right? Both the plan for uh, the capstone requirement and the further development of the uh, Marine Science Academy uh, under the umbrella of uh, the IV career uh, pathways. I think in total, when you look at our program of study, uh, when it comes back to you for further uh, uh, revision next year, um, I think we have some just wonderful choices for students, and uh, we should. We're a diverse city. Uh, we, need diver we need a lot of choice to maintain the diversity that, that we have. And so um, this is, um, this is a, a, a very good example of, uh, of excellent work toward that regard where you could have both diversity and excellence at the same same time, and not only a single path to, to excellence. Thank you all. Good job. Is there a swimming class as part of the curriculum for this program? Tom, does the captain's license require a swimming? Does the captain's license require swimming? I'm that sure. you have to swim? I don't know, but I would hope. It should. It's <laughs> pretty good to down the ship. No, yeah, there's no swimming requirement for either the, uh, the license or the permit. Oh. Okay. Yeah, you're on. Moving on to public comments, I don't know if we have a sheet somewhere. There was one on the table. Has anyone signed up for public comments? Public comments. Going once, twice, gone. <laughs>